Good morning, good morning, good morning. Let's give God a praise this morning, for he has blessed us to come into the house of worship. We got up this morning, sun is shining bright, and we are coming to the house of the Lord. So let us just give him praise and open our hearts and our minds that we might be receptive of him today. For he has brought us up from a mighty long ways, and at this time, God wants to be all that we can be, be in all of us. And to give us, so let us give him praise today, amen. Let us join our what, praise and worship this morning. Sometimes discouraged, but not defeated. Cast down, but not destroyed. There are times I don't understand. But I believe it's turning around for me. And I've had struggles and disappointments. Sometimes I, I feel so all alone and some of my friends, they, they let me down, but, but I still believe it's turning around for me, around for me. Listen, but it won't, it won't always be like this. Yeah, the Lord is gonna fix it. The Lord will perfect yeah. that concerning Just me. watch and see. Hey, and soon. The Lord will perfect 
Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, yes. Amen. 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 Don't y'all enjoy that? Amen. I know that spoke to some of you in here, didn't it? Amen. Because y'all have had some turn it around moments, haven't you? You've had some times where God has actually turned it around in your favor. Amen, 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 amen. So I want to just first take this time in this moment to welcome you to Union Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. Welcome to our Palm Sunday service. This is also the day where we're going to install and ordain some people. And we also have a baptism afterwards. Amen. God is just so good, isn't he? Amen. Amen. So we're going to do this expeditiously, but do we have any first-time guests? Don't worry, we're not going to make you say anything. If this is your first time here, would you please stand to your feet? We just want to just welcome you. This is your first time here? Amen. 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 Well, on behalf of myself and Lady Mitchell and Union Baptist Church, we just want to take this time and say welcome. Amen. Um, if you don't mind, would you fill out our connection card within our, uh, your, your packet that you just got is just a little card. Just fill it out. Uh, then after the message, we're going to receive an offering. If you just don't mind, put that in the offering basket. That would allow us to just send you a letter, a text, just welcome you, th tell you thank you so much uh, for coming. And we just want to start building relationships with you. And one of the ways in which we do that is through uh, making sure that we can connect with you either email or text just to make sure we just tell you thank you for coming and let you know of other things that may be coming up as well. Um, today we are not having our children's church or teen ministry because we want everybody to be here and some of the things that we're doing also involves uh, the teachers uh, from um, the teen ministry. So we just again want to say uh, welcome. I'm not going to be up here too, too long. We're going to have uh, Reverend Green, she's going to come here in a minute and do our prayer. But we also want to make this take this time. Y'all know next Sunday is Easter, right? Yeah. Amen. And, and if you came here, we want to invite you back again next Sunday for our Easter uh, service. Uh, we have a great service planned uh, for you. And we just want to just, again, just invite you to that. Reverend Green, if you don't mind coming and doing our prayer. And then after that, Reverend Knight will be back. Praise the, Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord some praise. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, your word says in John chapter 12, starting at the 12th verse, that, well, in synopsis, a great crowd had come to the festival and Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and they had taken palm branches and went out to meet him shouting Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord blessed is the king of Israel Lord God we come to you today saying Hosanna we come to you saying, blessed is your name and worthy is your name. Blessed are you because you are king of kings and Lord of lords. Father God, we celebrate you today. Hosanna, we thank you and we praise you in this house today. We thank you and we praise you. We thank you because you brought us through, Lord God. You brought us to another Palm Sunday, Lord God. Thank you because we're celebrating, Lord God, not only your name, but we have 
people who are coming in your name to serve you. We thank you for an ordination service. We thank you for the installation service. We thank you because we are all coming to you, thanking you and praising you because we are all ministers of reconciliation. We are so grateful and thankful. Father God, we ask that you move throughout this service, Lord God, and you just touch every part of this service from the pulpit to the door. Bless Bella, bless First Lady Mitchell, and bless our pastor, Pastor Mitchell, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Bless our speaker, Dr. Caldwell, as he gives a word, a right now word for today, Lord God. Bless those who are online. In Jesus' name, we thank you, because this is a day of celebration. We thank you, and we pray and say amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Lord God. Praise the Lord. It is so good to see so many in the house today. But God has ordained it that you be here. You could have been in other places, but God said you'll be, be at union today, and we're glad to have you. So let's just give ourselves a praise and we thank God for this being here. So at this time, as we, we thank God for the parents and the children today, but they are worshiping with us. Amen. And the team ministry worshiping with us. It, but it's just so good to look out and see so many people today that you thought it not robbery to come into the house of the Lord. So we thank God for this time of worship, for this ordination service, and just for you. So at this time, the choir is going to come with the selection, and then we'll hear a word from our pastor. Amen. So let us silence our phones and prepare our hearts to hear a word from the, from the Lord.
one day I'll cross the river I'll fight life's fight no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know, I'll know He lives because He lives. I can face tomorrow because He lives. All of my fear, all of my doubts are gone because I know oh, He holds the future.
No human being on earth is a mistake. Not one of us is a mistake. We were sent here specifically to do something valuable. That means God had something that needed to be done that made you necessary. And most of us don't know our own purpose on earth. The average human being does not know why they're on planet Earth. They wake up every morning, go into a job they hate, working with people they don't like, getting paid less than they're worth, and dying too young from frustration because they don't know why they exist. And I discovered that the greatest tragedy in life is not death. There's something worse than death. The greatest tragedy in life is life without a purpose. Nothing is worse than being alive and not knowing why. This is a tragedy. To live for 80 years and still didn't know why you were here, that's a tragedy. Without a purpose, life has no meaning. It has no sense of destiny, no sense of precision. Why am I here? Amen. Amen. Praise God. We are, we are going to start off in uh, Matthew. If you could stand to your feet as we open up the word in Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 through 38 amen and as you guys are turning in your in your books i just want to give all glory to god who is lord of my life amen who is captain of my ship i want to give uh honor to, and just uh, thank you to pastor mitchell for allowing me to be here and and lady mitchell amen and um I, it looks like most of you are about ready and lastly also want to thank god for my wife valerie amen and my family. All right, looks like you guys are ready to go. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38. And it reads, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, 
because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Verse 38 says, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. While you're still standing, Father God, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you for a time we get to get into your word. We thank you for a time, Father God, dear Lord, that you can speak to us, God. Teach us with your word, God, dear Lord, and allow us to know what it is about you that makes us us, God. Dear Lord, show us how we ought to live this life, God. We invite you, your, the Holy Spirit into this atmosphere. The Holy Spirit is already in this atmosphere. And Father God, we just want to hear a word from you. Dear Lord, we praise your name. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. Amen. Amen. Uh, t today, as we begin, um, as, as we reflect for a moment, how many of you guys can agree that the pandemic was kind of tough? Everybody agree the pandemic was a little bit tough? I mean, we had people that were getting sick, right? And some people didn't make it. We had, th we had to start doing things that we had never done before. Some of those things were like masking. I, I never had to do that before. We had to start masking before. All of a sudden, we had to be six feet away from each other. All of a sudden, we started missing birthdays. And sometimes it was those important birthdays, right? And, and we were stuck in the house. And then we started doing things that we had never done before and started saying things that we had never said before. Like before the pandemic, we never said things like, hey, I gotta, I gotta jump on a Zoom, right? We never said that before. Never before in my life did I have to be strategic about where I was gonna get toilet paper from, right? Y'all agree with that? Before the pandemic, most of us didn't care about going to a birthday party and somebody blowing out the candles on the cake and then eating the cake after that, right? Most of us didn't care, except my wife. She was ahead of the times. My wife, she wasn't, she wasn't gonna just eat anyone's birthday cake. She had to look at them with a snotty and all that first. My wife was gonna grab the cupcake first before the, before the cake, right? So, we, so there were some different things that were going on. Before COVID, if you coughed or you sneezed in a crowd, so what? After COVID, you sneeze? <laughs> it's like you got the bubonic plague, right? Oh man, it was different. Now, before COVID, you could say this one line and go to the bank and it was fine. After COVID, it was different. So if you went to the bank before COVID, I'm sorry, after COVID, and you said this one line, hold up, let me go get my mask. <laughs> go into the bank, right? That, that was a little bit different, right? And one of the most bizarre things during COVID was even once we were allowed out, there was this shortage of workers. And, and that was kind of a weird thing because did anybody ever pull up at the fast food restaurant and, and there was a sign on it and said it's closed because they don't have any workers? I remember that happened to me and I was mad because I really wanted like a burger and some fries and they were closed because they didn't have enough workers. Everywhere we went, there were signs on the windows and the sign said, please be, be patient with us because we don't have enough workers. Did, did, did anybody else experience that? Well, let me tell you something. If you experienced going to the, the fast food place and it being closed because of lack of workers, or if you went somewhere and you experienced poor service or no service because of lack of workers, then you already understand our opening scripture. So our opening scripture said something along the lines of, hey, listen, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The laborers are few. So that started before COVID. That started, Jesus Christ was talking about that in Matthew chapter 9. The laborers were few. Now in the physical realm, the result of the fast food place being closed early because of lack of laborers meant that somebody wasn't getting fed right? In the physical realm, if the grocery store closed early, it means that somebody was not getting fed. Likewise, in the spiritual realm, people are not getting their spiritual food because there's not enough laborers. There's not enough laborers in ministry. There's not enough laborers in the classroom. There's not enough laborers in the choir. There's not enough laborers in missions. But God says there is a need. So the scripture, does, now, 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 now slow this down for a moment. The scripture doesn't just say the laborers for the harvest. It says the pray for the laborers for his harvest. Did you see that in chapter 9? He says pray the laborers for his harvest. Thank you. And so what that means is 
God takes this personal. God takes personal building up his people. God takes it personal to feed his sheep. God cares if his sheep are lost. And God cares if his sheep are taken care of. Now, some of you might say, well, why doesn't God just do it himself? Well, the thing is, that's not the way that God operates. He's a relational God. God calls us to be part of his work, right? Now, since God loves us and he wants a relationship with us, he invites us to do the work with him. But one way or another, God is going to call. But the question is, how will you answer the call of God? Because the only thing more important than knowing God's call on your life is how you respond to it. How are you responding to the call? Now, if we respond the right way, life is good. But if we respond the wrong way, man, we might be all jacked up. Man, we might be an unnecessary turmoil. We might be having unnecessary stress, unnecessarily in the belly of a fish, unnecessarily blind, all from how we respond to the calling of God in our lives. So today, as we uh, celebrate Palm Sunday, and what was Palm Sunday but Jesus Christ answering the call of, of the Father and entering into Jerusalem. And as we look at our ordination service and installation service, we have individuals answering the call in different aspects of ministry. So it's fitting that we talk about how do we answer the call of God. Now we know that God is going to call but then there's another scripture that says, well, many are called, but few are chosen. And yet there's another scripture that says we ought to uh, make our calling and election sure. Well, that means there's something we got to do to get into the scriptures to make sure we are accomplishing those two tasks. So today we're going to talk to you from a thought process of answering the call of God. We're going to look at a few characters in the Bible. We're going to look at Saul and Moses and Jonah. And we're just going to look at how did they answer the call and what can we learn from the way they answered. Is that all right? We good? All right, so Acts chapter 9. We're going to start off with answering the call. And this is going to be lessons that we learn from Saul. And Acts chapter 9, verse 1. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. In verse 4 it says, Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul! Why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. Amen. When we consider the story of Saul, I want you to consider that Saul thought he was doing everything right. He thought he was doing the will of God. Saul was a Jew. That means he did not affirm Jesus and Jesus who he was. And he was going after all of the disciples of Jesus, the believers in Jesus. He was persecuting them, imprisoning them, and having them executed. You ever know someone who was super passionate about something and wrong? You, you ever know those people? Super passionate, but just wrong. In my house, we actually call that the incorrect corrector. The incorrect corrector. Going around, everything you say, they got to actually for. Actually, it's like this. Actually, it's like that. Well, Saul was actualing people to death. He was literally going around killing people, right? So Saul was an enemy of God. He, he, he if you think about it, he was actually a mass murderer. He was going around killing folk because of their belief. Eventually, God would get Saul's attention by, by blinding him on the road to Damascus. God blinded Saul for three days. During Bible study, Reverend Folks, I hope y'all tuned into uh, Bible study this past Wednesday because Reverend Folks was dropping some knowledge. And one of the things he said, he said, physical blindness is bad, but he said spiritual blindness is worse, right? So, so one of the things that God does with Saul is he takes away his physical blindness because he wants him to see clearly in the spiritual. Sometimes we rely so much on our physical eyes that we totally miss what's right in front of us. Instead, we have to rely on our spiritual eyes, which means seeking God and talking to God. 
So eventually, God spoke to Saul through Ananias in, in uh, Acts chapter 9 and let Saul know exactly who he was. Let me tell you something. There's something special about when God tells you who you are, when God lets you know who you are, when he lets you know that you are a special people, when he lets you know that he does have plans for you, when he lets you know that your steps are ordered by him. So God told Saul very specifically, he said, you are a chosen vessel. And then he tells him that uh, to, a chosen vessel to speak the name of God before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Saul would later be called Paul, would then go to write many of the books in the New Testament. Now that brings us to the first lesson that we learn from Saul regarding the, the call, and that is you are not your past. You are not your past. Think about how much Saul messed up. He was Despite his past, God would use him. Think about God. Saul was actually the enemy of God, but, Saul, but, but God still used him. He, despite him being the enemy of God, God will still call Saul to do great and mighty things. Despite being an enemy of God, God still calls Saul to preach. And he would preach and he would save lives and he would combat false uh, ideology and he would write 13 books in the New Testament. Listen, you think your past is messed up? Mm -mm. You, you don't got nothing on Saul. He was killing Christians. So, so you got to stop using that excuse, my, my past is too bad. No, God can use you. He used Saul, right? No matter how bad you messed up, God can still use you. The Saul to Paul conversion, it shows us that your past mistakes do not have power over your calling. I'm going to say that one more time. Your past mistakes do not have power over your calling that God has placed on your life. The second lesson we learn is that you cannot call yourself. Only God can do that. Okay? Now, I'm going to be real specific. We're not talking about joining a ministry. We're not talking about serving. We're talking very specifically about preaching, right? So we're talking about ministers and preachers and pastors because Romans 10, 14 says, how shall they believe on him who they've never heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So that means God has to call somebody to send them. Now, Saul was making up, before I get there, the good news is, God is going to call people. The opening scripture said, if you, if you look at the opening scripture, it said Jesus had compassion on them because they were walking around like sheep without a shepherd. And then so, and then so Jesus said, because of that, I'm going to make it so that I, I position some people and I call some people and I ordain some people so that they're not just walking around like sheep without a shepherd. Now, when you consider Saul, when Saul called himself, that's when he was walking around doing all that incorrect correcting, right? When Saul called himself, that's when he was totally wrong with what he was doing. The call cannot come from self. It must come from God. Now, I want to be clear that God did not change Saul's name to Paul. Like, when you think about Jacob to Israel, God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But this one, uh, Paul was also already part of Saul's name, right? So he actually had, like, you, you, we have two, two names. Some of us have three. A lot of us have three names. Well, Paul was already part of Saul's name. So God didn't change his name. He changed his identity. He changed how his, his relationship. Because Saul, check this out, Saul means to ask for. But Paul means to be humble. So when Christ humbled Saul on the road to Damascus, God, I'm sorry, when, when, yeah, when Christ humbled Saul on the road to Damascus, God humbled Paul. He humbled Saul, and then Paul emerged. Paul began to be used the way God wanted him to be used. You can't ask for it, but you can't call yourself. I remember, I remember a few instances before God called me to preach. I remember every once in a while, somebody would come up to me and say some things like, oh, you ought to be a preacher. And I would say, listen, I'm not getting behind anybody's pulpit unless, unless God says it. Amen? And I remember one time I was in my 20s and I went to my grandma's house. And um, grandma has this beautiful garden, so she had a little gazebo out there. So I went out there to read the word in the, in the garden. And I came back in, and she said, are you sure you're not a preacher? And I said, no, grandma, no, grandma. <laughs> I said, don't put that on me, grandma. No, no, that's not it. That's not me. And I remember another part time, and again, I wasn't called to be a preacher yet, but um, I, 
Valerie and I had gone to this party, and um, we had just got there. And as soon as we got there, this drunk girl came over to us. It was that, it, it was that kind of party. It was that kind of party. So this drunk girl came over to us, and, and someone called her name. And the, and the drunk girl said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm talking to the ministers. And I said, no, that's, that's, that's not it. Who told you that? <laughs> and I remember another time, I was at work, and, I, and I'm a physical therapist, so I was like stretching out a patient, and I'm stretching his shoulder, and we were talking about basketball and football and such, and out of nowhere, he says, he looks over at me, and he says, why are you running from the call of God? <laughs> and I said, we're talking about your shoulder, sir. But listen, I wasn't getting behind anybody's pulpit until I heard it from God. And then I remember very clearly one day God said, listen, I need you to write, I need you to preach, and I need you to teach. And that's what I've been doing since he called us. I need you to write, preach, and teach. So that's what I'm going to do. But the, God, but the call must come from God. There's one more point from um, Saul and, and media ministry. This is not going to be up there. Don't worry about it. He just gave me this one last night. But point number three from Saul is that it says it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to pick it. The New King James Version says goads, but the New King, I'm sorry, but the, yeah, the New King James says pricks. And so the, the Jesus told Saul it's hard to, pick, to kick against the pricks. And so what that means is that uh, in farming language, they, if they wanted to get some oxen to go a certain direction, they would hit them with a little, not hit them, but they would nudge them with a stick, okay? But this wasn't any ordinary stick. This stick had some spikes on it or some thorns on it. Now, if you moved in the same direction that the uh, farmer was, was urging you to go in, life was good. But if you kicked back or moved back against the stick, then that's when you got the pricks. That's when you got the spikes. And so God is telling Saul, if you do what I asked you to do, then it's going to be all right. But if you try to go against me, it's hard to go against what I'm telling you to do. So Saul started to learn, I got to do what God says when he says it. Amen? Amen. Let's go to our next person we're going to learn from. We're going to learn from Moses when it comes to answering the call of God. What did Moses have to say? We're going to read Exodus chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now, Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And I want you to know that God is going to get your attention in different ways. He got Saul's attention by blinding him. He got... Um, Moses' attention with a burning bush, but God, he might even get your attention by talking to you in a still, small voice, right? And so there's a lot of different ways that God will talk to you, but I encourage you to keep on talking to him about in the small things in life so that you can clearly hear him in the big things in life, yeah. amen? So let's continue in verse uh, 3. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Let's pause right there. I want to tell you one of the best things you can ever do in life is that when God calls your name to say, here I am, here I am. Um, but we'll find that Moses, he says, here I am, but he wasn't right there with Isaiah because Isaiah said, here I am send me. But Moses wasn't there just yet, right? Okay, so in verse 5, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And verse 6, then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. I want you to notice that when God calls you, he's going to make it very clear. He's going to make it very clear and reveal himself to you as he did with Moses. In verse 7, the Lord said, I have, indeed, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So 
I have come down to rescue them from the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. If we can pause right there for a moment, I just want you to consider that God sees the oppression of his people. I want you to see how God has compassion for his people. I want you to see that God is planning and preparing a way out for his people. Now, the people didn't know it at the time, but while they were going through, God was having conversations with other people to get them out of that. God was having conversations to say, hey, Moses, I need you to go to Pharaoh to let my people go. The people in captivity didn't know that at the time. Likewise, you might be going through something right now, not knowing that God is working something out for you right now. Just stay faithful with them. Just stay with them. Amen. I want you to see that God sees their oppression. Don't you ever, don't ever think that God does not see your pain. Don't ever think that God does not see your struggle. Don't ever think for one second that God doesn't care. He sees it. He sees you and he's going to work it out in his timing. Amen. Amen. Verse 10. Now, now let's, let's, let's get to the call because we're talking about the call here. Let's get to the call. So in verse 10 comes the call. In verse 10, he says, so now I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. All right, so how is Moses going to respond to the call? Let's look in verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? All right, so Moses correctly says, who am I? And that's what we do, don't we? Don't we do that? God asks us to do something, and we start talking about, who am I to do that? We say, who am I to write this book? Who am I to witness? Who am I to be in min a ministry lead? Who am I to lead someone to salvation? God calls, and we start doubting. Now, the way that God answers him ought to give us some hope. God doesn't say to Moses, he doesn't... If you, if, you, if you read what we're about to, when we read this, look at this. God doesn't start giving him a pep talk. He doesn't say, hey, Moses, you're great. You can do it. You're the best. He doesn't say any of that. In fact, God doesn't even begin to address Moses' insecurities. Instead, this is what he says in verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. And that brings us to the first lesson that we learn from Moses when it comes to answering the call. And the first lesson is, if God has called us to do something, he will be with us. Come on now. He was, he was trying to figure out, how am I going to do this? Don't worry about that. God is with you. The Alpha and Omega is right next to you. The God of this universe is in you. The power from on high is upon you when God has called you. See, we need to shift our perception from our own insecurities to the solid foundation that is found in God. Insecurities means what's in me, in me. We have to shift that perception to the external foundation of God. Because if God, can be, uh, if God is with you, who can be uh, against you? Amen? Who can be before you? So we'll continue this story in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 through 17. In Exodus 4, 4, 10 through 17, then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. You see here now, Moses is leading even more so into his insecurities. He starts saying, I'm, I'm slow of speech. I stutter. And how about you? What excuses are you giving God? I'm too young. I'm too old, I'm too busy, I'm not saved enough, I'm too fine, right? All, 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 all the excuses you give God. Someone said, I'm too short. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you who said it. <laughs> I heard him, I heard him. <laughs> but, but be honest for a moment. What excuses are you giving God? And verse 11, so the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the
the seeing or the blind. Have not I the Lord? Now God starts dealing with Moses with his insecurities, which brings us to lesson number two about answering the call that's from, from Moses. And lesson number two is God calls you despite your flaws. God's going to call you despite your flaws and despite your weaknesses. You ought to know that God doesn't need someone perfect. He needs you. Amen. He need, so stop getting caught up on your flaws. Stop getting caught up on your weaknesses because God called you knowing who you are. God called you knowing your weaknesses and knowing your flaws. I heard someone say, you may not be perfect, but you're perfect for this. Amen. All right, let's get into verse 12. Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Lesson number three from Moses about answering the call is God will empower and equip who he calls. I want you to check out, just listen to Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. It's not going to be on the screen, but just listen to this for a moment. Psalm 8, 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. I want you to know that when God ordains something, he orders the steps of that thing. He sets the boundaries of that thing. See, once God ordains, he will empower it to operate in the fashion that he created it for. When God calls someone or ordains someone, there is a pattern. I want you guys to get this pattern. If you guys can get this pattern, it would be cool. So the pattern is he creates, he positions, and then he empowers. Okay? Now, check out this pattern in, in the physical. God created the sun. He positions it, and he empowers it to give life, give light, heat, and so on. Y'all see that? Uh, look at the pattern in the physical. Look at the moon. Okay, so God created the moon. He positions it, empowers it to reflect light at night, impact gravity, have an effect on the tides, and so on. And so now, if God created you and positions you and empowers you to give life and have an impact and build the body of Christ, and so on. You see the pattern? You see the pattern? So God creates, he positions, and then he empowers. Okay, so now back to Moses. Hey, Moses, if God calls you, he's going to empower you to do what God called you to do. So we see God will empower the very weaknesses that you have. Oh, you couldn't fix those weaknesses before? Okay, watch what happens when God gets to it. Oh, you couldn't stop that habit before? Watch it become non-existent when God gets to it. Oh, uh, watch the things that you lust for are no longer desirable once God gets to it. But even with that, Moses wasn't there yet. Moses, he, he wasn't with Isaiah yet. He was still with here I, I am. He wasn't with send me just yet. So Moses still did not understand, right? When we get to the next verse, verse 13, but he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hands of whomever else you may send. So now Moses is saying, can you please send somebody else? I don't want to do this. Can you just send? And, and, we, and we laugh, but we do the same thing, don't we? We, we? we do the same thing. We do the same thing. Can't so-and-so do it? You know what? Pastor's not busy. Pastor could do it. <laughs> Pastor said, he said, amen. They, they do that to me. They do that. So we, we say, can you send somebody else? And Moses said, can I send somebody else? And that's what brings us to our fourth lesson from Moses. And the fourth lesson is, there is no nobody better than you for your calling. There is no one else better than you for your calling. Why? Why no one else? Well, here's, here's why there was nobody better than Moses. Here's why. Moses was uniquely positioned on both sides of the battle. He was one with the Israelites because he was an Israelite, and he was one with Pharaoh because he grew up in the palace. So now he is uniquely positioned to impact both parties. He is uniquely positioned to understand both parties. He is uniquely positioned to persuade and lead both parties. Can you send someone else? No! There's nobody else that can do what you do. There's nobody else that has been positioned the way that God has positioned you. Nobody else. God has positioned you. Check the pattern. He creates, he positions, and he empowers. That means there's something unique about, about your background, your likes, your dislikes, your pain, your joy, your suffering, your victories. There's something unique about your testimony that is going to speak to specific people. Can he send someone else? Nope, you're it. You're it, doc. There's some unique things about you 
that he has ordained and positioned in you. That means there's no one better for your calling than you. Amen. Let's continue in verse 14. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. So listen, even Aaron had a calling. Even the background characters have a calling and a purpose. Even they have a call. That's why 1 Corinthians 12, 15 tells us that we are all one in the body of Christ. So that the foot cannot say to the hand, I'm not a hand, so I'm not the body. And the ear cannot say to the eye, I am not an eye, therefore I'm not the body. No, we are all part of the body and all have a calling and all have a purpose. Aaron's call was to be glad in his heart and to help and assist the man of God. So you might not be Moses or you might not be Aaron, but let me tell you, child of God, you have a purpose and a calling in this life. Amen. You have a purpose in the body of Christ. And if you're a member of union, you got a purpose and an integral role here in the body of Christ at union. And if you don't have a church home, you ought to get one because God has a purpose that he wants to work out in your life. And he's going to do that at, in, in his, in his, at the church. Some people say, oh, I don't got to go to church. Well, I'll tell you what, God will use you mightily in the church. He's going to pour into you in the church. Amen. And then we can go out, to the, out besides the four walls. And this we are reminded that your calling is not for you, but it's for the rest of the body of Christ. Your gifts are not for you, but for the rest of the body of Christ. That means it's not about you anyway. It's about freeing those who are captive. It's about advancing the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. So in verse 15, now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. Verse 16, so he shall be your spokesman to the people, and he, he himself shall be as a mouth for you, and you shall be to him as God, and you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the signs. I want you to see again how he creates, he empowers, and he positions. Amen. Amen. Let's go on to, let's go on to Jonah. We're going to get some lessons from Jonah about answering the call of God. Amen. And as we go to Jonah, before we even get to the first lesson, just a little intro to Jonah, as we get to the uh, Jonah, I just want you to remember that when we read these uh, accounts in the Bible, these are not just stories. These are not uh, fables. They're not just uh, a nice metaphor. These are historical accounts of what actually happened. Now, there are some times where it is poetry. And, and, and the wording will let us know that. There are some times where it is metaphor or allegory, and the wording will let us know that. But if it doesn't say that, then we take it as fact. This is what happened, all right? So when we read about Abraham and Moses and Paul and now Jonah, it's, I want you to remember that it's not about being entertained, okay? It's not about getting a ooh and an ah and, and wasn't that cool. Rather, what it is about is God is revealing himself to us. He's letting us know how he is, and he's letting us know how he interacts with us. Amen? So when we read Jonah, keep that part in mind. It's not about the ooh and the ah. So let's get in. And, and Jonah chapter 1, it reads, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. All right, so in the, those two verses, that was the call. The call was, go to Nineveh. Why? Nineveh is messing up. They are, they are messing up left and right. And so now, because God has mercy, he wants to save them, right? And verse 3, but Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found the ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Let's pause there for a moment. You know, I never realized this before, but um, we were, the teenage ministry, we were in, in the room the other day, a few weeks ago, and we were actually looking at about where Tarshish was versus where Nineveh was. And I never realized this, but so Nineveh was 500 miles northeast of where um, Jonah was, right? So it was a little bit of a hike. 
But what, what, what Jonah does is he gets on a boat to go 2,500 miles the opposite direction. So for us, so we in Delaware, if you, if you watch it online, we, we, we in Delaware. So that's like God saying, hey, I need you to go to Boston or a little bit north of there. And we say, no, we're going to get in a car and go to California. Jonah was going in the total opposite way. Now, it would be one thing if he just said, no, I'm, I'm going to think about it. He didn't do that. It would be one thing if he said, no, nah, I'm not going to do that right now. But he got up to go the total opposite way. And so now, it's gonna, now God is going to start dealing with him on his disobedience to the calling. Amen? All right, here we go. So how did, how did God respond to the disobedience? In verse 4, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Now, don't just jump to Jonah being in a fish. We can't do that. We have, to, we have to look at this. Before there was ever a fish, God first sent a storm. By the way, as we discussed today, you might hear me say fish, and you might hear me say whale. The Old Testament says fish, but Jesus, when he talks about it, he says a whale. So I'll say fish or whale. It, it'd be interchangeable. So anyway, so check this. God responded by sending a great and mighty storm, which brings us to our very first lesson. God will get your attention in the midst of your disobedience. Amen. God will get your attention. And when God gets your attention, listen, let me tell you this. It's not going to be a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling. He ain't going to send that. He's not going to give you an email with a heads up and an FYI. He ain't going to do that. But he's going to get your attention. And he's going to get your attention in a way that it might not seem all that, all that comfortable. And when he gets your attention, I want you to see the order. Before there was a fish or a well, there was a storm first. Listen, sometimes God is sending you some storms trying to get your attention, and he just wants you to get some obedience from you. He just wants you to say yes, and he wants more than lip service. He actually wants you to do what he's asking you to do. Some people say, how did I get here? How did I get here? Because you ignored the first few storms that I sent you. And Jonah starts to ignore the storm. My prayer for you, my prayer for me, is that we do not ignore the storms that God sends us. So... What unnecessary storms are you going through? Because God is looking for a yes from you. Perhaps God is sending some stores your way. And, and, and how will you respond? Now, over the next few passages, Jonah asked the sailors to throw him into the sea. And I want you to know, he still wasn't being obedient yet. He was trying to give up. He was trying to say, ah, yeah, there's a big storm. I still don't want to go to Nineveh. Just toss me, just toss me in because I'm done with this. God still has mercy on him. God still has compassion on him. And you might say, well, how could he be compassionate? Because he threw him in the fish. Well, he, he could have been dead, <laughs> right? Sometimes God is getting your attention in some ways. God, why are you doing this to me? Because I love you. Because I love you and because I'm giving you some tough love. Amen? So now, and let's, uh, that, that, that's going to bring us to our next lesson from Jonah. And, it's, and the lesson is, God is preparing something for you for your obedience or for your disobedience, okay? Now, now, the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, a lot of people have a hard time believing that Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days. Some people get real scientific -y with me, and I, and I love science. I do. I, I talk science with you all day, especially the human body, right? But, but they start saying things like, oh, he couldn't have had enough oxygen. Or they say, oh, the stomach acids would have devoured him. Y'all, you guys have heard this. But here's what the skeptics miss. The skeptics, if you go back and read the scripture in verse 17, in verse 17, it says, the Lord prepared. Now, that's a mic drop right there. You can stop right there. If it says the Lord prepared, then who are we to tell God what he can and cannot prepare? Come on now. We have this thing that we do where we put God in a box. Oh, we say God can perform miracles, but only some miracles. Listen, I'm here to tell you today, if God can prepare the Red Sea to part and let the Israelites walk out of their captivity on dry land, then God can prepare a well for Jonah to save Nineveh. If God can prepare manna from heaven to rain down on the Israelites to eat, then God can prepare a well for Jonah to save Nineveh. Come on now, if God can prepare the fire for Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego and walk through and they were not burnt, then God can prepare a well for Jonah to save Nineveh. 
we have to stop putting limits on God and what we can do. How dare we, knowing good and well that we are miracles ourselves, tell God that he can't do that miracle? Knowing the very fact that some of you are miracles right now just sitting in that seat. For if only they knew what you knew, what you went through to be in the seat that you're in right now, that means God could do a miracle. Amen? Make it make sense. Listen, can we just talk about the preparation of God? We said in verse 17, he said, the Lord prepared the, the fish. Can we talk about the preparation of God right now? If God prepared a well for Jonah and his disobedience, I can't even imagine what God is preparing for me and my obedience. Can you think about that for a moment? I can't even imagine what he's going to prepare. Can you imagine when he says um, uh, he's preparing a mansion for those who love him? He says, if I, I'm preparing them. He's, I can't even imagine when he says, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has what? Has prepared for them that love him. We can't tell God what he can and cannot prepare. But how about you? How will you answer the call of God? Because God is going to prepare a consequence for your disobedience or a reward for your obedience. How will you answer the call? The third lesson we learn from Jonah is that it's not about you. It's not about you. Listen, the call, it wasn't for Jonah. It was through Jonah. The storm, it wasn't for Jonah, but to save Nineveh. The well, it was meant for Jonah specifically to save Nineveh. Your call, it might be to you and through you, but it's not meant for you. It's meant to save souls. It's meant to heal the brokenhearted. It's meant to empower the body of Christ. Send laborers to his harvest. Amen. Speaking of miracles, let's, let's learn from our very last person we're going to learn from today when it comes to answering the call, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. What are some lessons we can learn about answering the call from Jesus? The, the lesson one, we're going to throw lesson one up there. The lesson one is the humility of Christ. When Jesus Christ answered the call, there was something about his humble nature that we, that we ought to be able to uh, grab something from. If we look at the scripture in Matthew chapter 21, verses 6 through 9. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They bought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on them and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. From this scripture, we get the very idea of that term of Palm Sunday. So now Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and he's answering the call of God, of, of the Father. Now some people will call this... Um, Passion Week, because uh, this was four days before cr Jesus Christ was crucified, amen, it was right before his resurrection, and so now they are actually laying down the palms before him, right, and so as, God, as Jesus Christ is doing what God called him to do, and he's entering in, the way he entered in was really interesting, because you think he would have came in like the President of the United States, you think he would have came in like a king, but he came in in a different way. Now, again, for those online, we are in Delaware right now. We are in, uh, you know, the home of President, uh, President Biden, right? I mean, he lives at the White House now, but, you know, before that, he was, he was here. And he comes back here every once in a while. And when President Biden comes back, there is a motorcade. You cannot get near President Biden because of what's in front of him, what's behind him, and what's on the side of him. In fact, what's above him, you can't even fly in a certain area when, when the president comes back in. You thought that maybe Jesus Christ would have came in like that. He didn't enter in like that. Maybe he would have came in like a king comes in. Now, I've never really seen a king come into anywhere before, but I have seen the movie Aladdin, right? <laughs> Y'all seen Aladdin? So he comes in on, a, on an elephant, and there's confetti, and there's fireworks, and there's dancers and all that. You think Jesus would have came in like that? But he didn't come in like that either. He came in real humble, and he came in on a donkey. And so as Jesus Christ comes in really humble on a, dump, on, on a donkey, and, and it lets us know how we ought to answer our call. Our call is not going to be about our title. It's not going to be about our position, our status, nothing like that. We got to come in just as, think about how Jesus Christ at any moment 
could have just called down legions of, agent, of, of angels at any moment. He could have just done that. He says, no, I'm going to put that aside for, for a moment. At any moment, he could have entered in however he wanted to enter in, but he came in as a donkey. Hey, how humble was he? Second Peter 2, 6 says it like this. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. So on this Palm Sunday, as we answer the call of God, let us be humble enough to serve one another. Let us be humble enough to put aside our status, put aside our money, put aside our reputation, and humble enough to serve as we emulate Jesus Christ in answering the call. Amen? Amen. Amen. We're about to close up. Matter of fact, we're in our last scripture. You guys did good. We're in our last scripture. Our, our last scripture... It's going to be in uh, 2 Peter 1.10. And, and I don't know about you, but when it comes to my calling, I don't want to fall. And I don't want to stumble. Amen. And, and, and unfortunately, we, we see all these examples of fallen and disgraced pastors and fallen and disgraced ministers. We even see fallen and disgraced gospel artists, right? We, we see fallen and disgraced politicians. We see all these people who, who had a calling and all of a sudden... They're, 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 they've fallen. And so what do we do to make, make it so that we don't fall? And, and, and so I'm going to start in verse 10, and then I'm going to circle back. We're in, in 2 Peter verses 1, verse 10. He says, um, give diligence to make your calling and your election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. All right, now the scripture says we have to be sure to make our calling and election sure. If we do these things, we will never stumble. Would you like to know what those things are? I do. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right, so, so verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. You see, God has given us everything that we need that pertains to life and godliness. Verse 4, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Remember, we started off in verse 10, and now we're going to go, and now we're going to look to see what are those things that I need to add to make sure I'm not falling. But also, here it is in verse 5, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Verse 8, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. I want you to know in the passage that we just read, twice we see the word diligence. Twice in verse 5 and verse 10, it says diligence. Diligence means constant effort to accomplish something, to be attentive, to be persistent in doing anything. That means we need to be consistently putting effort into adding these virtues. We need to be consistently adding all of the things that we just read about in, verse, in the verse there. You see, it is a daily process of sanctification, a daily process of separating yourself, a daily process of seeking God, a daily process of being led by God. Now, our time with God can be either volunteer or voluntold, right? Saul found that it was voluntold. Jonah found that it was voluntold, right? They could have said yes in the beginning. We can voluntarily seek God's face every day and be adding to our faith, virtue, and knowledge, and self-control, and that is sanctifying ourselves, or we can throw ourselves out and have God put us in our place where we can only seek him. 
That's why Saul was blind for three days, only relying on God. That's why Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, only relying on God. That's why Jesus was in the ground for three days, and to be absent with the present, I'm sorry, to be absent in the body is to be present in the Lord. So they were away, and they started to lean on God. There's something special about spending time with God. For when I spend time with God, it's what leads to my transformation. When I spend time with God, it sustains my dedication. Spending time with God is how I hear my call, it's how I answer my call, and how I make my election and calling sure. So as we close this thing out, the opening scripture said that the harvest was plentiful, but the laborers are few. Here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for us. God, open up our eyes like Saul that we can see our purpose. Open up our ears like Moses so we can hear our calling. Help us to avoid Jonah's journey by being obedient to your call. Show us what to do, God, that we can walk out our calling in the humility of Christ. We know, God, that you create position and empower. So when you call us, show us how to walk in it, God. So when we hear the call, we can respond, not like Moses with here I am, but like Isaiah did with here I am, send me. Because that's how we answer the call of God. Amen. That's all I have for you today. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As the deacons position themselves, as the deacons position themselves, amen. Is there anybody here that you've not yet had a chance to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Amen. Amen. You can't even begin to get that call from God if you have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And, and, and check what we said earlier. We said God will position some people, and there are some people positioned at the front right now that can pray for you. There are some people that are positioned right now at the front that have been empowered. Amen. Is there anybody, as all eyes are closed and all heads are bowed, if there's anybody here who has not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, amen, we just want to pray with you. Amen, we just want to pray with you. The next call, maybe you don't have a church home. Amen. And maybe God is unctioning you and maybe God is urging you that maybe union is the church for you. The scripture earlier said that it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to kick against the goads. And so God is, is, is urging you that union is the place. Is there one? Amen. We just have some people that want to want to pray with you, talk with you. Amen. And make that happen. Amen. And the next call is maybe you just need prayer today. We have some prayer warriors up here. Amen. If you, if you need prayer today to altar is open and we got some people that can pray with you today amen maybe God has been calling you to do something and you want to come up here and get prayer about that very thing amen the altar is open for my people online if you would like salvation you can text the word salvation to 302 389 5655 and then if you're looking for a church home, you could also use that same number and just text the word JOIN, 302-389-5655. Just text JOIN and somebody will be with you. Amen. Father God, dear Lord, we love you, God. We praise your name, God, dear Lord. We thank you for inviting us to be part of your ministry, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Dear Lord, I pray for everybody here right now that they can hear clearly your voice, God. Dear Lord, that, that when the scriptures are opened to them, Father God, dear Lord, that the, 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 their hearts burn within God. Dear Lord, we want to hear from you, Lord. Father God, speak to us in a way that only you can speak to us, Lord. Father God, that we might be changed. Father God, that we might be transformed. That we might know our purpose clearly, God. Dear Lord, continue to speak to our lives, Father God. We pray for those who are sick, dear Lord, and for those who could not make it here today, dear Lord, that you might just heal them, Father God. Dear Lord, we pray for those, dear Lord, that are going through some things that they can't even speak about right now, dear Lord, but you know what's going on. And so, God, we pray that you please just work things out, Father God, dear Lord. We pray that we learn from you, no matter if it's a 
joyous thing or a painful thing. Let us learn more about, more about you, God, in, in all of that, God. Dear Lord, we love you. We praise your name, Father God. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. We, we can't do it by ourselves, God. We need you, Lord. And so, God, dear Lord, we pray. We pray for your power, Father God, dear Lord. We pray for your anointing, Father God. Dear Lord, we pray for the breakthrough that comes through you, Father God. We pray for delivery, Father God, dear Lord, that comes through you. Deliverance that comes through you, God. Father God, we can't do this thing on ourselves or by ourselves. It's all about you, Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. We love you, God. We thank you for your name. We thank you for your grace, Father God. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for our sins, God. We thank you for giving us an example, God, in the name of Jesus. Dear Lord, you are worthy, worthy, worthy to be praised, God. You are worthy to be praised, God. Hallelujah, God. You are worthy to be praised, God. If you don't do anything else for us, Father God, you are worthy to be praised, God. Holy is your name, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Glory to you, God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Father God. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. Oh, the song says, I love you, Jesus. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, God. Amen. Let the church say amen. <clears throat> amen. We thank God for the message and the messenger today. God's call. At this time, we will have our announcements. As we prepare for our ministry of giving. Have you enjoyed the word today? Did you hear? Did, did you feel God touching your heart today? Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you for the, what we have heard today. We pray, Lord, that as we come and bring our gifts to your altar, we pray that you will bless them, that they might be used for the building of your kingdom here on earth. Bless the giver and the gifts. In Jesus' name, amen. You may follow the directions of the ushers as we also will hear our announcements. Good afternoon again, church. It's just awesome seeing all of our new guests who have joined us. As you know, today is Palm Sunday, and immediately following the morning worship experience, there will be a baptism held in the fellowship hall below. We schedule all baptisms on the fourth Sundays of the month. If you would like to get baptized or find out more about the process, please contact a member of the Diagonet Ministry to sign up, receive your baptism packet, fill it out, and then return it to a member of the Diagonet Ministry who will schedule your baptism. Grow classes are offered first, second, and third Sundays of the month in the conference room from 10 to 10.45. Sunday school is also held in the lower fellowship hall from 10 to 10.45 a.m. Easter egg hunt next Saturday, March 30th, from noon until 3 p.m. Children's Church will host 
the Easter egg hunt. Thanks so much who have all donated plastic Easter eggs. We have reached our limit and do not need any more plastic egg donations. We are asking for a few volunteers for this event to assist in monitoring the petting zoo and face painting stations. Please see any member of the children's church teachers to sign up or become available the day of the event. Easter Fashion Show Parade. Next Sunday, March 31st, the Children's Church will be having an Easter Fashion Show Parade for the children right before dismissal for the Children's Church. If you would like your child to participate, just have them ready to be lined up on Easter Sunday morning. The teachers will direct the parade, parade before and exiting downstairs. T-shirt orders, the T-shirts are ready to be picked up downstairs after church dismissal for all who have placed an order. We will have a list of all prepaid orders. Special thank you from the Children Church Ministry. Thank you to everyone, including the ministries who have been supporting the Children's Church and their upcoming events. A special shout out to the media ministry and the men's ministry for your generous contributions. Also to those working in the church office. We are union and the children appreciate you. Headshot pictures. Media ministry will be starting back with headshot pictures on Sunday, April 7th of any new member of our church for our church directory and proof of membership. Please be encouraged to take a photograph after service or during any free time to get your picture snapped. For those who serve in a ministry, your team lead may schedule a time for your ministry to be able to get a group picture or individual pictures. Thank you. Meeting room. We now have another meeting space other than the conference room for meetings, which is downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you have any meetings, please be sure to reserve the space with the church office by email. Prayer service and noonday Bible study. Prayer service is held in person here in the sanctuary at 11.30 a.m. every Tuesday, followed by the noonday Bible study. Wednesday night Bible study. Join us each Wednesday night, 7 p.m. for Bible study with our pastor on Facebook. Exodus 36 project. As you know, we are now in phase two and we need your continued support by giving $5 over and above your regular giving. We continue to say thank you for all who have been obedient. Pastor report line. If you have sickness or a death in your family, you can call or text 302-505 5758 and provide the pertinent information. Next Sunday, which is Easter, there will be no announcements. Thank you. This concludes announcements. Amen, Union. We are about to get into our uh, installation and ordination service. Um, before we do, I just want to make sure that we are on the same page with the announcements. This coming Saturday, uh, please, ma'am, please, sir, bring your children out to the Easter egg hunt. That is going to be right here from 12 to 3, and we're going to have a face painting. And uh, I'm not going to be painting no faces, but we're going to have somebody painting faces for you, um, a petting zoo, and also the Easter egg hunt. Um, and then the following day is Easter, and we are going to have our Easter um, service, which is going to be right here in the sanctuary. We're going to have a good time as well. Um, this coming uh, 
week, I'm going to actually counsel Bible study uh, on Wednesday. Y'all can still have it on um, Tuesday. Um, and I'm going to ask you to attend one of the IMA services. Um, we got a couple of this week. Um, and just go, let's go support um, IMA. Amen. All right, I see we are finished with um, the offering. So we will get into um, our installation and ordination service. And then right after that, we do have a baptism downstairs in the fellowship hall. Uh, we have someone getting uh, baptized. And that is actually, I know you may not like what I'm about to say, that is actually more important than what we are about to do right here. Because that shows this young man's uh, dedication to God and he's making a public uh, display to the world that he has accepted Jesus as his Lord and personal Savior. Amen. And so I ask each of you um, to right after this to go down to the fellowship hall and let's support uh, this young man in his baptism. Amen. All right. Would all of the ministry leads come to the front and face me? All of the ministry leads. If you are leading a ministry, um, if you was invited to the ministry lead meeting, I am looking forward to you coming down here. Amen. Face me, face me. Amen. Face me. down a little bit. Amen. All of the ministry leads. Amen. Amen. Y'all look good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. So ministry leads, do you promise to uphold the vision of this church, the core values of this church, and to, show, and to um, display to this church and to the world what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a leader? If you agree, will you say, I do? Do you accept your position as the ministry lead that you are in, if you agree, will you say, I do? I do. Amen. Union, these are your leaders. Will you turn around and face them? <laughs> Amen. 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 Union. Do you promise to follow, to listen, to support them in their endeavors as they lead each ministry that they're in? Union, if you agree, will you say, we do? We do. Amen. Leads, would you please turn around and face me? We are going to pray over you, leads, and we're going to ask if uh, Reverend Knight will come and pray over you as we install you as ministry leads then when we get finished installing you as ministry leads we're going to ask that you take your seats in the first two rows here because we're going to need your help as we install the offices amen eternal god first of all we give you thanks we give you praise and we give you honor for these who we have sent here that they might do the work you call them to do in leading your people. For we know that we are all servants of yours doing the work you have called us to do. It may not be an easy task, but we know that through you all things are possible. So Lord, we pray that you would just touch the hearts of these your leaders that they might be diligent in their work, doing the 
work that you have called them to do. It might be hard or tiresome sometimes, but Lord, you are all that we need to get the job done. So Lord, we pray that you will just touch each and every one of them with the gift that you have given them, that they might be used for the building of your kingdom by teaching the church and leading the church and doing the work that, that the church might see you in them. We pray, Lord, that you will strengthen them on every side. We realize that when we come to serve you, that the attacks are also coming. But Lord, we know that you, your strength is in you. You are all that we need. My, my, as you said, my grace is sufficient. So Lord, we pray that you will strengthen them today, not just today, but throughout this walk with you, that you will guide and direct them, that they will be able to guide and direct the people that they're over, that they are to shepherd. We thank you for all that you do and what you are going to do. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory as you continue to guide and direct this entire church from the pastor to the door. We thank you and we praise you and give you honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Union, let's give God a hand praise for your ministry leads. Amen. Would you please take a seat right here? Now we're going to move to install our officers. Would the three new trustees that we have, would you please come and stand to the front? Would you please turn around and face me? Amen. The appointment given to you by the fellow members is not one that should be taken lightly. It is imperative that you guard your behavior, your words, in a special sense, you are an example to this whole congregation of what men and women of God should do. Be concerned with the needs of this church family. Be full of wisdom and be versed in scriptures and ready to give a witness. You are not just trustees, but you are also children of God. You are not just trustees, you are also leads in this church. You are not just trustees who takes care of the building, but you also have to be concerned with people as well. Trustees, do you accept this role? If you do, would you answer, I do? Union, would you please stand to your feet? And I'm going to talk to Union. Union leadership has been entrusted and delegated to individuals since the apostolic times, since the early church. This has been a constant thing over and over and over again. Union, do you acknowledge and receive these new trustees? If you do, would you acknowledge by saying, we do? Now we're gonna ask if Reverend Folks would come. And Union, I want you to stretch forward your hand Leaders and ministry leads, I want you to come up and actually physically lay hands on them. All of the ministry leads, come up. If you are a ministry lead, I want you to come up and physically lay your hands on them. Reverend Folks is going to come and he's going to pray over them. God, our Father, we come now at this time in this place, this your people. We ask now in the name of Jesus that you would touch the hearts of your ministry, of your leaders. We ask now that you would touch the hearts of your uh, trustees. Uh, remind them that you are entrusting to them the care of your people. We pray, Father, that uh, we will not take this lightly, but that they will go forth and do it to the glory of you. 
that whatever they do, whether they eat or drink, they will do all to the glory of God. Father, we pray that you will uh, uphold them on every side. We pray that you will encourage us as union to uphold them and to encourage them as they go. We ask this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Union, would you turn to Union, would you welcome and accept your new trustees? This is not something that we enter into lightly. Amen. Trustees, you may be seated. Amen. Would those deacons who have finished their deacon training, who is now getting ordained, would you come to the front? The deacons in training who are now getting ordained, would you come to the front? and my sisters, you have been bestowed a great responsibility by being selected and trained to be deacons in this church. Will you accept this responsibility and strive to fulfill your position, which you are called to promote the interests of this church, to assist the pastor and do whatever you can to make sure that the needs of this church is taken care of. If you agree, would you say, I do? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> do you accept responsibility to promote the scriptures, division, constitution, and message of union? If you agree, say, I will. Yeah. Will you accept the office of a deacon in this church and promise to faithfully to perform the duties required in this church. If you agree, will you say, I will? Will you promote and cooperate with the pastor and to further the interest in this church by promoting harmonious and effective working of all its ministries? If you agree, will you say, I will? Union, would you please stand to your feet? Union, will you acknowledge and affirm these deacons? Will you esteem them, encourage them, and cooperate with them as they perform their duties as deacons? If you agree, will you say, we will? Yeah. Amen. Now, deacons, I charge you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I charge you to strive in the office of a deacon. I charge you to faithfully live your life, to perform your duties faithfully. I charge you to be peacemakers and peacekeepers. I charge you to love, to work, to do, the office of a deacon. Amen. Deacons who are already here, would you come up as we pray for these deacons? If you are currently a deacon, will you come as we lay hands on them? Come on, deacons. Come on. Amen. As Reverend Perry would come, and she's going to pray the ordination prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you as we look out upon these deacons today, the newly ordained and those who've been laboring for a while. We thank you for them today, Lord. We pray for their hearts, Lord, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, 
as they know that they are called and empowered by you. Help them, Lord, to look out among the congregation and answer the question, answer to the response when the call comes out to say, here am I, send me. May they, as, as uh, Dr. Caldwell said this morning, be able to look out on the people with compassion. Thank you, Lord, for hearts of compassion. Scripture says Jesus looked upon the people with compassion and was moved. So thank you for the movement of your spirit in them as they labor in this place, helping pastor, helping the people, even giving a call out to the stranger along the way. I thank you for their prayers because we know they're going to be praying diligently over this church and over one another. I thank you for their service because we know their service, Lord. Service is needed. What did the word say today? They looked out and asked, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So thank you that they've joined in as laborers in this vineyard. Thank you, Lord. Bless our pastor, Lord, as he looks out with discernment of spirit and finds those whom you will call. And then, Lord, I thank you for those sitting around today who will answer the call as time goes on. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the studies of our deacons. We know they've studied much, and they've studied hard. And may what they've studied be embedded in them, Lord, never to leave, but to encourage and to inspire them as they go along the way. Thank you for each and every one. Thank you for their families who understand the calling and support them in their calling. We bless you and we praise you for this day, Lord. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Union, let us give our hand praise for our newly ordained deacons. Ministers who are going to get ordained, would you please come to the front and face me? I don't take the opportunity to ordain ministers lightly. In fact, as you know, in order to be ordained by me, it takes years, years of training, years of faithful service. And now you're about to launch into your ministry. And so I wanted to make sure that as you launch into your ministry, that you were thoroughly equipped and that you had the credentials necessary and y'all have been faithful. And so now we're going to ordain you. Amen. We're going to license you. We will license you. You can sit down. We will give you a license, okay? Okay. Amen. Do you accept the Bible as God's inspired, infallible, inerrant, immutable, indestructible, and indispensable word? If you do, say I do. Do you understand the requirements, responsibilities, and realities that you are that is about to be placed on you as being ordained as part of an ambassadorship of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you agree, say, I do. Will you endeavor to be diligent in the study of God's word, to be faithful in prayer, an example of Christian piety and discipline before your people and the community in order
order that your life may be a worthy Christian example and your ministry a blessing to God. If you agree, say I do. Recognizing the sacred responsibility of your call and aware of your own human weaknesses will you seek the leadership and empowerment of Holy Spirit in order that you may faithfully minister to him who has called you. If you agree, say I will. Now my charge. I charge you to pursue the word of God. I charge you to practice the word of God. I charge you to preach the word of God. I charge you to teach the word of God. I charge you to be faithful to the word of God. And I charge you to protect not only each other, but also protect the ministry that God has given you. Would you bring two chairs for me so that they can sit down? going to anoint you. Thanks again for the crowd. Reverend Knight, can you give uh, Pastor Davis the mic? I'm going to anoint you. And then ministers, I would like for you to come around after I anoint them. Pastor Davis will pray over them. They can be seated. Amen. I anoint your head so that you can think the thoughts of God. I anoint your ears so that you can hear the voice of God. I anoint your hands so that you can do the work of God. I anoint your feet oh, my God. so that you can walk according to that path. I anoint your head so that you can think the thoughts of God. Your ears so that you can hear the word of God. Your hands so that you can do the work of God and your feet so that you can walk the path of God. Amen. Ministers, will you please lay your hands on them? Pastor Davis, would you please pray for them? My God and my Savior, these two have labored diligently They have served this man of God. And God, we thank you for the day. God, I thank you that you have continued to keep them in your word. That they continue to be upright. Always abounding in the word of the Lord. Now, God, as they're being launched into their ministry, we ask that you bless it, that you keep it, that you anoint it because they have been appointed. God, you are awesome in our sight. And this morning, we just, this afternoon, we just want to say thank you. Thank you for the time that they spent laboring in your vineyard. God, help them not to take this appointment lightly. For this is a task that only few are chosen. And God, we will continue to give you glory and honor and praise for their lives and their ministry. It is in the matchless, wonderful name of Yeshua, who is the Christ we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Amen.
Union, please stand to your feet. Amen. Amen. Stand to your feet, Union. Amen. And let's just give God thanks for these two individuals. have one more thing to do. Amen. We just have one more order of business and then we'll get down to the baptism. Um, based off of um, our constitution, we had three um, for personal things. We had three trustees that rolled off of our trustee board. Would you please stand so that we can give God praise and thank you for your service. The three, amen. Amen, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you may be seated. Amen. Amen, we have four deacons. Uh, three of them are rolling off. And one of them is being emeritus. Mother Ballantyne, would you please come to the front? The three, because she's going to be getting emeritus today. Amen. The three that are rolling off is um, Deaconess Beecher, Marsh, and Mills. Would you please stand to your feet so we can give God praise for your service? <laughs> see what our trustees, our chairperson of our trustees has rolled off. So that means we have a new chairperson of the trustees, which is Sister Valerie Caldwell. Would you please stand? <laughs> and um, thank you. And I um, have been the chairman of the deacon board for almost three years now. Amen. And now we're going to transfer that to Deacon Justice. Amen. He's all the way in the back. So, Mother Ballantyne um, has been a deaconess in this church for years. And um, one of the things that we offered our deacons the ability to do was to get emeritus. That is kind of similar to like retiring uh, from being a deacon. Um, she is, has chosen to be emeritized. Um, and we're going to do something for her that normally uh, we do when a person passes. Um, it's a way of honor. Um, but I believe in giving people their flowers while they live. Amen. So, um, some years ago, her husband, who had passed away, was honored with a bench right here by putting his name in memoriam. Memoriam. Is that how you say that? Memoriam? Amen. Uh, and this is the plaque right here that was on that pew right there. We're going to give that to you in honor of your husband. And replace it with a new one that says, in honor of Chairman of the Deacon Board, Youth Director, Deacon George E. Ballantyne, December 12th, 1930, through March 15th, 2008, and Mother Mary Ballantyne. Yeah.
communion, let's give Mother Valentine a hand praise. Amen. Everybody, let's stand to our feet. Our service is over. Amen. Amen. Let me just bless you and then ask everybody to join us downstairs in the fellowship hall for our baptism. Brother Jermaine, if you have not gone downstairs and gotten ready already, you can do so at this time. Amen. If you're ready, then amen. We will be right down there with you shortly. Let me close out it with a blessing. May the Lord bless you. May the power of God be upon you this week. May the Holy Spirit comfort you and give you peace. And may Jesus' blood redeem you forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Go in peace, go in peace, go in peace. <laughs>